So Gio might have stepped away. He's been on since like eight. I'm sorry. Oh. He didn't unmute. Um, yes, everything looks fine. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Michael's already did it. Katie's good. All right. And then um, Amanda, let's see, because I'm sharing my screen in English, I cannot see the other screens, like the other options for screens. So I'm going to join on another Zoom account so that I can see Kristen's um, screen. So just admit me okay. and I'll name it something random. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, and then Haiti just gave us the cue that we're all set with AV and interpreters, so everything is good to go. We'll keep checking those uh, feeds just to make sure. And we know that there's about a 20 to 40 second delay, um, but we'll keep checking it to make sure that it's through. But if anyone else checks and they notice that AV goes off or there's no sound or no audio or no visual, just let us know in the um, the thread. And then, oops, here's Andrew. Hi, Andrew, good morning. While Andrew's getting audio, Nefertiri, do you want to be in the group thread with us to, to see what's going on there? Are you good listening? That Teams group that you mentioned, because I don't have, I want to see the agenda. Okay, I'll, um, so do you, and I didn't hear the first part of what you said. Did you want to be in the thread with us or do you just want me to send you the agenda and stuff? The agenda is fine. Thank you. Okay. I'll email that to you right now. And then Andrew, can you hear us? We can hear you. Can we do a tech check with you real quick? Yep. Can you okay. hear me? Yep. Cool. All right. Cool.
All right, do we want to check in and see which advisory group members we are still expecting so we can start reaching out? Yeah, Kajal and Vanessa, can you give us a run through of who's not here yet? Yes, so we're missing Benjamin Cuevas, Camille Panu, Castillo Estrada, David Corey, Emily Rooney, Everett McGee, and Maria Oliveira. Hey, this is Michael. Um, Maria won't be joining. I think she had something come up and she's traveling to LA today. Thank you. And Nefertiri, I just sent you an email. Um, just let me know if you can get those links because sometimes when I send them, it removes access. So hopefully it didn't, but just let me know. Okay, I'll check right now. All right, thanks. Amanda and Haiti, this is Mandy. Hi, Mandy. Francisco just texted us saying that he doesn't see the interpretation button. Okay, it, it has him down as an, he's currently active as an interpreter on the Spanish channel. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure why that would be. Also, I don't see the interpretation icon on my end. So I'm not sure if I am on the Spanish channel. Uh, do I need to maybe stop sharing in? Did Adriana, um... Did it come up for her when she came back on? Yeah, so for me, I had been joining via audio. And in order for you to get the interpretation feature, you have to join via um, computer audio. So if he's joining by phone and by his laptop, he may want to just rejoin and choose computer audio. And then we had Ava just join. Hi, Ava, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. All right, thanks. And um, just so everyone knows, um, Jesse couldn't make it today. So Ava's going to be sitting in for her for her self help. Katie? Hey, yes. this is me. And yes. Yeah, um, when you're sh sharing screen, you will not be able to see the interpretation button, but Francisco should be able to see it. Okay. I want to make sure I'm on the Spanish channel. Um, should I stop sharing so I can make sure that I'm on the Spanish channel? Yeah, and then you can re uh, share again. Okay, great. Screen. Thanks. Hey folks, we've got about a minute. Is there anything else we want to check on? All right, cool. Uh, Jessica Nitzel, are you ready? Can you see the Spanish um, PowerPoint? Check. I can. Um, I don't know that I can, but I'm on a second screen, so who knows? Am I good to stay here, or do I need to switch to the link you sent me via email? 
No, you just stay here, Nefertari. I think I just copy and pasted everything in case you got booted or something. You could. Oh, just I see. On. Okay, thank you. And did those links work for you for the agenda and everything? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, folks, everybody ready? Yep, I believe so. Okay. Yep. So let me switch my slide. All right, and Amanda, do you want to just let us know when we are live on the webcast? We have been live on the oh. webcast for about 20 <laughs> minutes, folks. <laughs> now we're ready to start the meeting. So. OK, great. So I'll go ahead and get started. All right, so welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining the Safe and Affordable Fund for Equity and Resilience Program, AKA the SAFER Program, um, fifth annual advisory group meeting. So this meeting is being held virtually and is being recorded and webcast publicly in English and in Spanish. Uh, main points will be captured by our note takers and sent to the advisory group members within three weeks. So we want to start by um, honoring the groups who have experienced economic, environmental, and social disadvantages as a result of historical marginalization. So we recognize that we are meeting during a very challenging time. And we recognize the impact this global pandemic has had and will have on marginalized communities. We also recognize that this country is reeling from the loss of yet more black lives at the hands of unjust systems. And many people are impacted by the fires that are currently raging across our state and the Northwest. On today of all days, September 11th, we want to thank the first responders for all that they do and, um, and recognize one of our advisory group members today, Don James, who's absent because he is fighting fires on his hollow lands in Northern California. And so I wanna thank each and every one of you for showing up today in the ways that you do uh, to support indigenous and community voices as we work together to provide clean, safe, affordable water to all Californians. I'm going to the next slide. And we wanna thank each of you for finding a way to join us virtually today with so much going on. We thank you for your patience and your understanding as we move to an 100% virtual meeting space so that we can adapt to the current public health concerns. And we're doing our best to make sure that everyone can participate in an effective way and that this time is valuable for you. So some guidelines for our meeting are one, to please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, two, to take breaks as you need them. Three, to use your participation packet. Your packet was emailed to you and it was mailed to those who requested it. And it contains all of today's meeting materials, including the agenda, technical support information, and breakout instructions. And for technical assistance and language support assistance during this meeting, please email safer at waterboards.ca.gov. All right, moving on to the next slide. So for those of you who are listening, if you'd like to submit a comment as a member of the public, please fill out the online form at the link listed on the slides. If you cannot access the form for whatever reason, please email your name, your affiliation, the last three digits of your phone number, and your comment topic with the subject as AGM5 public comment to safer at waterboards.ca.gov and wait for your name to be called during the public comment section. All right, I'm gonna switch the slide. All right, so today we have many OPP team members working behind the scenes to make sure that we have as few participation bumps as possible. So they're here to support this process at all of its levels. We have Jessica, who you'll hear from later. Um, we have Adriana, Amanda, Katie, Kajal, Michael Ben, Mandy, and Vanessa, who are all working behind the scenes. Um, so I just wanna take the time to thank them. And now, um, if waterboard staff can unmute themselves and say your name and your department or office, 
uh, beginning with our water board members, if you could just uh, unmute yourselves and say your name and your department or office. So we'll start with board member Firestone. Hi, Laurel Firestone, <coughs> member of the water board. Great, thank you. Um, Nefertiri, do you wanna go next? Hi, Nefertiri Cooley, communications. Great, thank you. Uh, Andrew? Andrew Altevoked with the Division of Drinking Water. Great, Joe? Uh, Joe Karkowski with the Division of Financial Assistance. Uh, Jeffrey? Hi, this is Jeff Wessel with the Division of Financial Assistance. Thanks, Jasmine? Good morning, Jasmine Oaxaca with the Division of Financial Assistance. Great, Anne? Anne on the line? Nope, okay, Michelle? Good morning, Michelle Frederick with Division of Drinking Water. Thanks, Julia? No, okay, uh, Kristen? Kristen Appold with the Division of Drinking Water. Great, and if there's any other water board staff who are on the line and wanna unmute themselves, feel free to do so and say your name and your department or office. All right, looks like we got everyone. Thanks y'all. So now we'd like to hear from our meeting participants. So when I call your name, Please unmute yourself and spend about 15 seconds sharing your name, your physical location, or where you're calling from, and a few words or a short sentence describing what successful outreach for the SAFER program would look like. So the mute button should be on the left corner of your screen, and if you're joining by phone, you're going to want to press star six to unmute yourself. So we have uh, quite a few folks to get through, so like here's an example of how fast this should go. So my name is Itzel, and I'm calling in from my dad's house in Long Beach. And successful safer outreach for me is outreach that intentionally focuses on communities that have limited resources and that have been historically left out of previous programs and funding. All right, so when I call your name, please introduce yourself and answer the questions that are on the screen. So again, it's your name, where you're calling in from, a few words or a short sentence describing what successful outreach for the SAFER program would look like. So we'll start with Elena. Hello, my name is Elena Saldivar. I'm uh, calling from my home in Pixley. Um, I'm glad to be here and um, hope to uh, be of help in anything and be, and hopefully I can understand things better after today. And I thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be on this um, committee. All right, thank you, Elena, for sharing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so next, let's see if Horacio is on the line. Hi, uh, my name is Horacio Mesquita. I'm, from, uh, I'm calling from my office in San Gerardo, in Salinas. And I hope uh, that we can get uh, you know, find out who's drinking polluted water and try to get them some clean water and then help them out to get clean water. There's, there's a lot of folks that are getting poisoned. Mm -hmm. and we stop that. So hopefully we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Horacio. Um, your audio was a little bit faint for me. Mike, this is Haiti. Oh, hi, Haiti. Mm -hmm. Is there Okay. <laughs> no worries. All right. Next up, we'll see if, um, let me see who's on my list. Uh, sorry. So, oh, one second. Okay. Isabel, if you'd like to go next, go ahead. Hola, buenos dias. Mi nombre es Isabel Solorio. 
Estoy llamando desde mi casa en la comunidad del ENER, en el condado de Fresno. Eh, a unas pequeñas palabras, sería enfocarnos en soluciones eh, para comunidades desfavorecidas y ayudar en equidad. Gracias. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Gracias. So, Isabel is on our Spanish line. Um, and um, for those of you on our English line, Isabel said that her name is Isabel. She's calling from her community of Lanier in Fresno County. And um, Safer Outreach for her is focused on, or successful Safer, safer Outreach for her is focused on um, disadvantaged communities. Uh, that's, and it's a outreach that is focused on equity. All right, uh, next up, let's see. Camille, if you'd like to go next. Hi, uh, my name is Camille Panu. I'm calling from Irvine, California. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I'll share for now. I'm looking forward to listening to all the other members and hearing their thoughts. Okay, thank you, Camille. Next, Dawn White. Good morning, I'm Dawn White, um, calling from my home in Placerville. Uh, successful outreach to me would include, you know, each of the small or disadvantaged water systems that are struggling or out of compliance would have a clear sense of what programs or opportunities there were for help. Um, I think reaching out to the, the small systems that are struggling and may not even be aware of some of the safer programs or funding opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Thank you, Don. Uh, next, Emily. Hello, um, I'm Emily Rooney and I am calling from my home in Lodi, California. And, uh, Success to me um, for this program would be engaging disadvantaged communities, particularly in rural areas that are so oftentimes neglected. Um, but I also enjoy my participation on this group just because it's always an opportunity for me to look, to learn more. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Next, we have Eva Dominguez, who's filling in for Jesse Snyder today. Eva, go ahead. Hi, my name is Eva Dominguez. I'm calling in from Visalia. Um, California. Um, and for for me, I think, um, you know, reiterating, having outreach to the small communities, and, you know, using some of the resources that we have, you know, with the TA providers, making sure there's stuff available for them to share with the communities that they work with. Thanks for that. And welcome. All right, next up, Katie Porter. Good morning, I'm Katie Porter. I'm based in Los Angeles, but calling in today from New York as I had to travel home to help some on some family matters. Uh, for me, uh, my advisory group members have already covered a little bit of the who successful outreach would be defined as. And for me, the what on successful outreach is making sure that it, it's maintained as a dialogue and not just one way communication on disseminating information, but also listening to the challenges and potential other solutions. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, and thanks for joining us from so far. Next up, Michael Claiborne. Yeah, hi, I'm Michael with the Leadership Council calling from um, my home in Sacramento. And uh, successful outreach to me is meaningfully engaging impacted residents in identification, identification of solutions, implementation of solutions. Um, and I think there needs to be a particular focus on those served by domestic wells and state smalls because you'll you'll need testing um, and the solutions there are, are often a little bit more difficult. Great, thank you. Next up, Lucy. Hi, yes, Lucy, and I'm coming from my house here in West Goshen in Tulare County. 
and to me um successful will be um to be more to be more focused in the small rural communities to make sure that they have safe and affordable drinking water and also uh, to make sure that we don't forget about the um, private well owners yes thank you next nicholas Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Nicholas Schneider. I'm with the Mojave Water Agency. Today I'm calling from my living room in Hesperia, California. Uh, successful outreach to me is after this program, uh, allowing these agencies who are receiving the funding to become self-sufficient so that they can continue to provide safe water for everybody, uh, but also ensuring that they can run their systems. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, Sergio, if you'd like to go next. Oops, Sergio, it looks like you're on mute. What would happen to me? Sorry. Um, you know, this is Sergio uh, calling from my office in La Quinta. Um, I measure uh, the uh, successful outreach when the community finally has reach the level of community-driven approach that are capable to influence the decision-making and prioritization of infrastructure projects, mostly when it comes to drinking water. Uh, so uh, those resources can be deployed successfully in those communities. Yes, thank you for that. Um, now, are there any other advisory group members that I missed? All right, great. Well, thank you all so much for sharing that with us. So as I heard your responses, um, I'm reminded of how important it is for us to have so many different voices and perspectives involved in the SAFER program because you all brought sort of a different take in your answers, right? Even just for this introduction. So thank you. And thank you all for showing up as passionate, motivated and dedicated leaders for each and every one of these meetings. It's really appreciated. So now I'd like to give the mic to my OPP colleague, Jessica Bean who will take us through safer review and updates. So Jessica, the mic is yours. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. And thank you again for taking time to be here with us. Um, we have two main goals for today's meeting. Uh, we're going to share the safer updates and timeline, and then we're gonna review and discuss the drinking water needs assessment. Um, so jumping into our first goal, we have a few updates to share. Um, the SAFER 2021 advisory group applications are open. And just as a reminder, those applications close on September 30th. Um, so for new folks who are applying, but also for any of our SAFER advisory group members who may be terming out at the end of this year, um, that'd be a, your opportunity to reapply. Um, we also wanted to let you know that we have an advisory group uh, frequently asked questions document now on the SAFER website. And that is if you go to the advisory group webpage, um, you'll see there's actually quite a bit of uh, information about the process there, but there is the new FAQ that can um, help answer some of your questions. And then we also wanted to let you know that our drinking water systems violation tool um, has been updated. And so it's live on our website as well. So for any of you who have um, seen that tool, we've done some revisions to it. So I recommend going back, taking a look at it. This is also a reminder that this is kind of a new process for us. If so, if you have any feedback on that tool, we suggest that you email the safer uh, email. So that would be great. Um, okay, so uh, next, let's see. Next, we're gonna be sharing uh, a timeline, a 2020 timeline of the SAFER program. But I wanna begin by doing a quick recap so um, we all are make, make sure we understand the different components of SAFER, SAFER. So as a refresher, Senate Bill 200 established the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to address funding gaps and to provide both short and long-term solutions to water systems. So each year, the State Water Board adopts a fund expenditure plan. Um, that fund expenditure plan directs how money from the fund can be spent. So the plan is based on a drinking water needs assessment, which we're going to discuss a bit today. 
The needs assessment identifies which water systems are not providing safe water or are at risk for not providing safe water and the reasons why they're unable to do that. And then finally, we have the fund expenditure policy, and this guides how the fund expenditure plan is developed and implemented. It defines key terms, identifies who is eligible for funding, and identifies what types of projects are eligible. So there are a number of important dates that we have coming up. Um, I apologize, it's a little hard for me to see. So we have, um, looks like itzel i'm sorry could you go over the timeline i'm just having trouble seeing it <laughs> i apologize sure, no worries and um you all have received an emailed copy of this powerpoint as well so feel free to to look through that but it says for september 2020 we have a safer update to the board and then on the 30th the 2021 advisory group member applications are due in october we have a second risk assessment webinar on the second. On the sixth, we have a safer update to the board. On the 30th, there's a finance dashboard that's being launched. And then in November, on the 20th, there's a cost assessment webinar. And for December, we'll be having another safer advisory group meeting on a date to be determined. And on the 14th, there will be a risk assessment webinar. All right, and that's all that's on the timeline. Great, thank you so much, Itzel. I appreciate that. Okay, I think that's it for our updates. Um, so now I'd like to jump into the fund expenditure plan updates with Jasmine Oaxaca. So Jasmine, can you join us? Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine Oaxaca, Supervising Water Resource Control Engineer from the Division of Financial Assistance, and I'll be giving an update on safer funding. Next slide, please. Here are a few of our past milestones and where we're heading. I know Jessica just shared one, but this one's a little bit different. Um, so SB 200 was passed in July 2019. And then in May of this year, the State Water Board adopted the policy for developing the fund expenditure plan for the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. And then in July, the board adopted the fiscal year 2020-21 fund expenditure plan for the fund. <clears throat> we look forward to the results of the statewide needs analysis next spring, which is also when we will start developing the fiscal year 2021-22 fund expenditure plan. Next, please. I wanted to remind everyone that while SB 200 established the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, this fund is just one part of the larger safer program and the funds available to us. So this is a snapshot estimate of the funds available to achieve the safer program goals for the new fiscal year for drinking water projects in small communities totaling about 530 million. There is 117 million from the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. That's the 130 minus uh, about 13 million for staff costs and, and other implementation costs for the program. There's 31 million for, from various general fund allocations and 35 million from Proposition 68 groundwater. So these three sources are available to fund both capital and non-capital projects. For capital projects only, there is 151 million available from drinking water bonds, 85 million from uh, the drinking water state revolving fund grant or principal forgiveness, and 110 million from Proposition 1 groundwater. I wanted to note that while this is an estimate of funds that are available to us to go towards drinking water projects in small disadvantaged communities, uh, these will not all be committed this, this full year. So once completed in spring 2021, the Division of Drinking Water and UCLA's needs analysis will provide an initial estimate of overall 
capital demand, as well as estimates for interim solutions, state smalls, and domestic wells. Next, please. Since the last advisory group meeting, there have been some new developments on the status of the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. The August cap and trade auction generated over 400 million, which is significantly better than the May auction. The Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund is one of many programs with the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund or GGRF as its source. So at this time, we are unsure of how much will be from the GDRF for this new fiscal year. Some good news is that the proposed baby budget or SB 115, if it's approved, uh, will allow a quarterly transfer from the underground storage tank cleanup fund as a loan to the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to make up any shortfall from the GDRF. As such, signs are pointing to the first quarterly deposit into the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund being in full, expected in October 2020, of 32.5 million for projects and staff costs. And that 32.5 million is just the 130 million uh, divided by four quarterly installments. So additionally, I wanted to note that given the timing of those quarterly installments to the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund, um, the last of which would be expected in July 2021 after the May auction, um, that means that we will not be able to commit the full 130 million to projects this fiscal year. Next, please. So as we look towards having that full 130 million, um, I wanted to remind everyone of the top priorities for the fund, as stated in the fiscal year 2020-21 fund expenditure plan. And those are to address emergency or any urgent funding needs where other emergency funds are not available and where a critical water shortage or outage could occur without support from the fund. We also want to address community and school water systems out of compliance with primary health standards, accelerate consolidations for systems that are out of compliance and those that are potentially at risk, and provide interim solutions for state smalls and domestic wells with source water above a primary maximum contaminant level and initiate efforts for long-term solutions. Next, please. I also wanted to remind everyone of our target expenditures for the fund by type of solution. Uh, these are also from the fund expenditure plan. Um, so we're targeting 19 million for interim solutions and emergencies, 30 million in technical assistance, zero to fund administrators, and again, that because we still have funds available from 8072 to fund administrators. 6 million for planning, 10 million for direct O&M support to support consolidation, and 49 million for construction. Uh, this totals 114 million. On the right, we also provided a subtotal by type of water system. And then the remaining funds will be going towards pilot projects and staff costs to total the 130 million. I wanted to note that pilot project, pilot project discussions for the point of use and point of entry and then the direct operation and maintenance support have been initiated, but are still in early phases right now. Next, please. Another part of the fund expenditure plan was to establish performance metrics through a few specific numeric goals. And so this, this slide shows our last year's accomplishments, our new goals, and how we are doing so far, even though it's, very, it's still very early in the new fiscal year. But our hope is to provide 
interim solutions to 150 communities and schools have executed or completed planning assistance projects for 150 communities and to complete long-term solutions for 100 communities. Next, please. So at this time, uh, we're happy to take any questions. I have a question, this is Sergio. Go ahead, Sergio. Yeah, on the slide, what is supposed to uh, happen on by the end of this year and following year? I think when it says spring, it should be 2021 instead of 20. Oh, right, that, that was a typo, I'm sorry. So spring, Spring 2021 is when the needs analysis is expected, and that's also right. when you'll start developing the next year's fund expenditure plan. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, wow, that was corrected so fast. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sergio. I, I also wanted to mention um, that there was a, it looks like the um, Spanish version of the PowerPoint has a different image than the, um, than the English version, Jasmine, where the, um, the, the breakdown, yeah, the available funds. So we, we'll be updating that, um, but the $529 million, that's the correct image, right, Jasmine? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to let folks know that we'll, we'll go and revise that in the presentation, but the 529 is the correct value. Are there any other questions? This is Michael, uh, not a question, but, uh, but a comment. Um, my understanding is SB 115, the backstop for the funding for SAFER um, was signed by the governor on Wednesday, uh, which means that that bill has been approved. So good news there. Okay, thank you. That is good news. Any other um, questions or comments? All right, well, thanks, Jasmine. Um, next, we have Michelle, who's gonna give us an update on administrators. So Michelle, if you'd like to join us. Good morning, can you hear me? I can. Fantastic, good morning, Jessica. So hi, my name is Michelle Frederick and I am with the Division of Drinking Water. Um, I'm a supervising engineer for the new SAFER section as well. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you a broad overview, because I think, you know, as Kristen later in our discussions goes on to talk about the needs analysis unit, I think it's important to put that in context with some of the other activities that we're doing in two of our other units. So we have the needs analysis unit, but we also have two engagement units that are located in the field. So as the needs analysis works in partnership with UCLA and the Division of uh, Water Quality, trying to develop very clear methodology um, on what are our at-risk systems and our potentially at-risk systems, um, you know, focusing on community water systems, including tribal, state, small water systems, and domestic wells. But then we also have people in the field right now that are working um, in partnership with the Division of Financial Assistance and the Office of Public Participation. And so those are our engagement units. Um, and, and so we're not waiting for the results of the needs analysis unit to, to start that engagement process. I just want to um, make sure that that's clear for everyone. We are working with systems um, that we've identified through collaboration with our, our field offices to start that effort um, while the needs analysis unit work is in process. So they are working um, on interim assistance for systems that are uh, may, may already have problems. We're working on administrators, um, consolidations, um, working with trying to find funding solutions in collaboration with CFA, and also helping coordinate people with uh, technical assistance. Next slide. And so, as I just said, there's, there's several different efforts that our engagement units are doing. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about administrators here, um, but they are they are doing several things: consolidations and water partnership outreach, administrators, interim solution um, training, and they're also doing something that um, is is sort of preventing new water systems. I don't know how many of you remember, but 1263 was a bill that passed a few years ago that um, has us review when new public water systems come for an application. And we look at whether consolidation is an option or not. And so they are also engaged in that effort, which I think sometimes gets forgotten, but is, is really important um, and part of those services that they render. Next slide. So I'm going to dive in just a little bit on the administrator authority because I think there's, you know, since that's relatively new, I think there's interest there. So we have two different types of administrators. We have a full scope administrator and a limited scope. I'm going to, we're, we're focusing more on the full scope administrator um, at this point, uh, just because a lot of the limited scope efforts we can do through technical assistance. But so just to give you an idea, our full scope administer, administrator is a person or entity who is appointed and or authorized to exercise total and complete managerial control over a designated water system. So a good example of where we can use an administrator is, uh, you know, if, if a board has dissolved and, and no longer is available to operate a water system, if, uh, you know, there's a consolidation pending, but the water system itself doesn't have the, the manpower to facilitate that uh, process, that funding process. So there's a couple different places where we can use it. Um, the applicability, you know, it, it, it's applicable to uh, community water systems or state smalls that are serving a disadvantaged community and that the state board finds consistently fails to provide an adequate supply of affordable and safe water. So that's, you know, there is a, a subsection of public water systems where we are using that. And then um, previously there was a policy handbook that was adopted by the board um, back in September. So next slide. So we've done several outreach, our engagement units have done several outreach efforts. Um, we've spoken with the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, the uh, Tulare County Board of Supervisors, the City of California Cities, um, City Council, City of Fireball, City Council. Um, we've also talked and with different technical assistance providers, self-help, California Rural Water Association to sort of gauge interest on this type of activity. We've also um, are working currently on a request for uh, qualifications which we expect to be out in the fall of 2020. And as part of that, we've also created sort of an administrator FAQ. And then also, you know, just so that people really understand as they go to, to fill out the request for qualification, what is an administrator and, and sort of what they're tackling as well. And it looks like there's a typo in the next one, but it should have said administrator FAQ on liability. So we're also, um, there, as we've been reaching out to people, there's also been questions about liability for the administrator, and so um, addressing that as well. And so those should be up on our website relatively soon. And we will do a blast out on the safer um, Lyris list when we do the request for qualifications and that's finalized and, and we start doing that. That will be a continual um, application process. So next slide. And then we also created an administrator website. Um, as of August, 2020, we had initiated five um, administrators. There's one more um, that's not shown there that was mandatory consolidation uh, that was done earlier. But actually since August, 2020, now um, up to date, we have so far done nine administrators. And so we've taken, and, and by starting that path, basically what we've done is we've notified these various water systems um, that we are designating them as potentially in need of an administrator. And so we will be moving to 
the public meeting phase next for all of these to about you know get community input and thoughts on you know that process and also on options for different administrators so next slide and then just i'm happy to take any questions that people may have thanks michelle so does anyone have questions on michelle's information hi michelle katie porter um, just curious about that last uh, slide that you showed about systems designated for possibly needing an administrator. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you are uh, delineating between those who have self-recognized or are all these uh, cases that the state board or the needs analysis unit has identified, just um, trying to understand sort of like the, the spectrum of involvement with the system. Um, you know, some of these, some of the ones that we have done to date um, have indicated desire for an administrator. They have expressed, you know, they, they don't feel like they can continue. They're, they're in violation. They, they feel like they need help. Some of, a few of them have been um, systems where there just has been, they're at risk and there's been bacteriological problems and we have not seen those resolved or they've been functionally abandoned. Um, so it's not based on the risk assessment data. It's been based on field input on where we needed it. Is that the question? Did I answer it, Katie? Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like you're covering the spectrum of them. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully, yeah. I have a quick question. Um, this is Eva from Self-Help Enterprises. Um, my question for the administrators, once they take over the system, how like far back are they liable for, you know, some of the issues that have been going on in the community? Um, because I, I'm wondering, you know, knowing some of the some of the potential administrators, they might not be willing to pull through with the whole um, situation if if they're going to be like completely liable for things that happened 10 years ago. Um, so I don't know if that's addressed somewhere or um, yeah. That that has been a, a big question and it's one of the reasons that we're doing an FAQ because there isn't the same liability protection in that legislation as there is say for um, mandatory consolidation. And so, you know, we've been working with the attorneys at various cities and counties and, you know, different groups as we're going through to try and understand what their concerns might be on a particular system. Um, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is covering for them to get liability insurance. Um, so that they would be able to be covered, but but it's you know it's not a perfect solution yet. We're still working through that, trying to understand what kind of liability insurance might be available. Thank you. Sure. Hi, this is Horacio. Um, Michelle, is is there a lot of systems that have this type of problems? Um, I mean, we've done nine so far that we're engaging with, you know, I think as we go forward, I mean, they will, will probably continue to use more of it, more of these. And, you know, I think as the needs analysis gets completed, we'll have an, a, another full list, not just our human rights water list, but also our full list of at risk systems to evaluate too. Sure. Hi, Michelle. This is Camille. Hi, Camille. Good morning. Um, I was wondering, is, has the board figured out how it's going to map out its community engagement plan once administ an administrator takes over? I know that there's been a lot of really great work done by LA County as the first administrator, for example. It would be helpful to hear a little bit more since oftentimes the administrator comes in when a board has, has often failed or failed to represent the people that receive services. 
So there is a required, I mean, for each community, Camille, I think it will be different. There is a required communications plan that we're expecting yes. from each of the communicate, you know, from each community where there's an administrator that will be one of their tasks. Um, but it will be different depending on the size and complexity of each water system. You know, one that's 13 connections may be different than, you know, something that's several hundred connections. Um, and so that's, we're really focusing on looking at it for a specific community. But I agree that, you know, UCLA, or sorry, not UCLA, uh, LA County has a lot of experience too. And we have worked with them to understand sort of um, some of the barriers and challenges that they had um, and are trying to learn from that. I mean, I know one of the things that we learned from them just from a liability standpoint, they indicated that they wouldn't have dissolved Sativa as early on. Um, they would have kept it. And so that from a liability standpoint, so that's you know one of the sort of lessons learned that we're thinking about too. Thank you. Hello, mm -hmm. Isabel, tiene una pregunta? Sí. Uh, mi pregunta es si la comunidad pierde todo el poder al entrar un administrador al sistema, a controlar el sistema, manejarlo. Can I get the translation just to make sure I answer the question fully? Jessica? Yeah, um, can, who's going to be able to come in and do that, folks? Are we going to have one of our interpreters switch over, or do we have a staff who's going to be able to? Well, if I may, uh, what I understood the question was that if an administrator actually go and take over oh, a particular water system, is the community uh, in the position to lose power or voice once the administrator is already in, the, in place of the uh, water. Exacto, esa es la pregunta. Thank you. Gracias. Um, okay, so is the community, well, the hope is that the community will be more empowered through better communications. Um, but certainly there will be, the administrator will have full um, managerial control over the water system and and that will include finances and things like that so i mean i think it depends on how you look at it we are certainly trying to make sure that the community has more of a voice through that communications plan and is really engaged in the process all right thank you help. We have a time for one last question on this. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Yes, it's Sergio. Um, we have a really, really complex issue here in the Eastern Coachella Valley and, and leadership council is the lead agency on that. Uh, but I just want to just to make sure that everyone understand that the, the realm and environment that we, that we deal with uh, when it comes to uh, owners of particular water system that are neglecting um, to provide the best services to the community. And particularly, it becomes more complex when those projects are located in Indian tribes. So every time that we have tried to uh, resolve uh, one particular issue that we have that is becoming extremely uh, noticeable um, with one mobile home park here in the Eastern Coachella Valley, seems like uh, uh, everyone struggled to actually get involved because there is a lot of legal ramifications. Um, sometimes uh, in this particular case, EPA at the federal level is involved. The, the state water boards is also involved. The communities is really, really involved. Um, the local tribal is also involved, but it seems like a, to the time we make a decision, uh, there is not a clear uh, path of how uh, they are going to provide solutions to this, uh, you know, emergency. This is a huge emergency for uh, probably a little bit more of 200 connections. So 
So, so the, the question is, what kind of mechanisms need to be established at this level so that we can have a, a plan to tackle these kind of situations so that every time that we meet, we don't we end up with no with no solutions, with no direction on how how to approach and address those contamination issues where the community has been suffering for the last uh, 20 years and my uh, recollection. Sergio, why don't you and I take that offline? Maybe I'll give you a call after the, the meetings today and set something up so that we can talk about that one specifically. Yeah, and, and, and of course, you know, I will love pretty much uh, Michael and Claymore also to be involved because they are the lead agency on, on, on trying to address this issue. Yeah, please. Great, thanks, Sergio. And thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I do want to let people know that uh, uh, if our English listeners could click on the interpretation button and actually select English, that way, when someone speaks in Spanish, you'll hear the translation in English. So I don't think everyone has that selected. And I just want to remind folks that that way we can all hear the different translations. Um, okay, great. So we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, this is going to be probably a little bit longer presentation because this is a lot of what we're going to discuss in our breakout sessions today. So I'm going to um, bring Kristen on. Kristen will do her presentation, then we'll take a brief break and then go into a deeper dive in terms of discussion. So Kristen, if you wanna join us. Yes, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Awesome. And can you see my slide? I'm toggling, see, there we go. All right, can you see my screen? Are we on the needs assessment components? Um, no, I, well, let me see. Oh, there we are, needs assessment components? Yes. Yes, I see that now. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Kristen Appold. I am the Senior Environmental Scientist with the Needs Analysis Unit in the Division of Drinking Water. Uh, you heard uh, many folks today mention the needs assessment, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to dive in with you all today to explain the different components of the needs assessment and to give you an update on where we are in developing our methodologies for all of these assessments. It's going to be a lot of information to, to dive into, so uh, please be patient. I'm going to try to cover a lot in a short amount of time, and I'm always happy to follow up with you after the call if you have more detailed questions um, or even if you have recommendations on, on our methodology development. I'm always happy to connect with you. So what is the needs assessment? Uh, the needs assessment has three core components. We have an affordability assessment where we're looking at water, uh, drinking water rates and trying to determine where our community is paying um, uh, higher rates uh, where affordability issues are going to come into play. We have a risk assessment where we're trying to identify those at-risk public water systems, state small systems, and domestic wells. We are developing um, many different methodologies uh, that align with those different types of uh, systems. And we're working with UCLA, the Division of Water Quality, and many other stakeholders to develop those methodologies right now. And then we have our cost assessment. And what our cost assessment does is it looks at all of those at-risk systems that we've identified. And we also look at all of our human right to water systems or those systems that are out of compliance. And we try to estimate how much it would cost for the state to come in and provide solutions for all of those communities. It's putting a giant price tag on all of the issues that we've identified, which helps us figure out, you know, what is the gap in funding that's available and funding that's needed and help us with our budgeting process within the fund expenditure plan. Before I continue, one of the things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, and I just wanna highlight it here because it's, it's in an image, is that our affordability assessment relies on metrics, right? Data points. And our risk assessment also relies on affordability metrics for determining risk. We wanna make sure that those metrics align across each of those assessments. And you'll see why that's important later. I'm gonna highlight it. Hey, Kristen, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I don't think we're seeing you flipping through your slides. Um, I just moved to the next slide. I'm on slide 23 now. Right, but um, are you? we're not seeing you change that on your on the, the screen you're sharing. Ah, okay. You, well, we're just um, seeing, so um, yeah, just to let you know. Okay, and, so and no, if you just no wanna 
if you just want to say flitch the uh, uh, um, next slide, we have someone else going on on this end. It's up to you. Okay, um, I'm on slide 23. Okay. Okay. Um, so you should see a pyramid, and I hope you all do. The purpose of our, our risk assessment um, is, and, and our affordability assessment is to help with the prioritization of technical assistance and funding uh, within the SAFER program. So this is just a little pyramid to show you how we prioritize uh, TA and, and funding. Uh, obviously, um, human health uh, is uh, of utmost importance to the water board. So those systems that are out of compliance, our human right to water systems are our highest priority followed by at risk, potentially at risk, and then those that are, are not at risk. I'm moving to the next slide, which is 24, uh, needs assessment uses. So how do we use uh, all those components of the needs assessment uh, within the SAFER program? Well, after we do our assessments and we have our at-risk systems, we have our systems that are um, experiencing affordability issues, and we have our cost assessment number, we hand those analysis over to the Division of Financial Analysis uh, which, you, or I'm sorry, of financial assistance. And they utilize those, um, those figures to help them pull together the annual fund expenditure plan and determine funding prioritization. Um, the, the vision of drinking water uses that information to target the engagement units, the Northern and Southern engagement units that Michelle had mentioned earlier in rendering services. So that interim assist, assistance, the consolidation, administrators, um, helping with planning, all of that. Um, again, the needs assessment helps with targeted outreach and engagement with those systems. I'm on slide 25 now. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the phases of the risk assessment. Again, we're in the process of developing methodologies for all of these three components. And this risk assessment uh, methodology is going through a five uh, phase development process and we're currently at step two here. So we've identified our potential risk indicators or metrics uh, that we may use in our methodology. We are narrowing that list down. We have an evaluation process. Um, we're going to set thresholds and weighting scores to those indicators to create that final methodology so we can have a final list of systems that are at risk uh, by the end of the year. And I'm gonna dig into this just a little bit more. Um, so what are risk indicators? You're gonna hear me talk about that a lot. Um, these are metrics, these are data points, um, composites with da different data points sometimes. Um, and they fall into these four bucket areas for our methodology. We have risk indicators for water quality, accessibility, affordability, and technical and managerial and financial capacity. We've been uh, engaging with the public for every step of our methodology development and soliciting um, recommendations from, from all types of folks. And we're, we've had really great participation so far. We've had two webinars um, this year alone. Uh, we had over 200 folks on April 17th and 70 in July. And again, we've identified um, uh, in July, we had 118 potential risk indicators. I think we're above 120 now based on feedback that we've received from the public. We do have a white paper uh, out on this topic and uh, recordings from these webinars are available on the SAFER website. I'm not gonna read everything on the next few slides. Um, I'm on slide 28, um, but we did identify again, quite a few potential risk indicators that we could use in our methodology. Uh, we've got a bunch under water, water quality, everything from trends towards MCL, uh, emerging, emerging contaminants, um, proximity to septic systems. Uh, quite a lot of recommendations have come in. Uh, accessibility indicators, things like, you know, do you have uh, sufficient water rights or water allocations? Uh, how many water sources do you have? Do you have a backup power supply? Um, are you experiencing significant water loss? Um, a number of indicators that would uh, help us assess if a system is having um, issues in providing it, uh, safe and continuous drinking water to their communities. Affordability, again, uh, a critical uh, component of our risk analysis. 
uh, we've identified uh, 22 potential uh, metrics or risk indicators that we could use in our, our assessment. Again, um, please check out our white paper to learn more about these. Um, historically, we've been using percent of median household income, but there's been a lot of research in the last few years of a bunch of different metrics that we could be using for measuring um, and predicting risk around affordability. And so on the slide here, um, hours of minimum wage, um, household delinquent and paying bills, extreme water bill. Um, a lot of these are measuring similar things, um, but just in slightly different ways. And so what we're looking at is, well, which ones of these are the best ones that we should use for our affordability risk indicators and for our affordability assessment? And then in technical, managerial, and financial capacity, again, we had 35 indicators that we um, identified back in July. Uh, examples of these are days cash on hand, do you have a full-time operator, um, you know, insurance coverage, a whole host of, of great indicators. And, and right now, we are evaluating those indicators. Again, I, I mentioned we had 118 identified. Um, and that's just too many for a risk assessment. I think that would dilute um, some of the great work that, uh, that we're doing here. So we needed a way to narrow down that list of 118 to something that's more manageable for us to really consider utilizing in our risk assessment. And so what we did, um, moving to the next slide on 33, um, what we've done is developed a, a evaluation tool, something to help us narrow down that list to something more manageable for us to really consider. Step one is looking at the risk indicator applicability. So how strong of a correlation is there between that individual risk indicator and a system's ability to stay in compliance? If there's not a strong linkage there, if folks don't feel like it's a really good indicator, it's not gonna do well here on step one. Step two dives in a little bit deeper. We have to look at the data that is used to, put to, uh, to pull together that indicator. Because some indicators, again, are made up of either one data point or multiple data points. So we need to look and see, do we have enough data coverage for that, uh, for that data involved in that indicator? If we don't have that data available to us for most water systems in the state, then we can't have an equitable risk assessment. It's, we're not gonna be able to use it. Um, so coverage is really important for us. Data availability, also critical for, for fitness here. If that data is not available on a regular basis, they're being updated on a regular basis, it's not gonna be reliable to us 10 years down the line when we're still doing our risk assessment on an annual, <laughs> on an annual basis. And so we need to make sure that that data is gonna be maintained and available to us um, as we move forward. And then the third step here is data accuracy and quality. Um, in some cases we're collecting data, um, but when you look at it closely, you, you realize that it's not being reported accurately. There may be some flaws in that data quality and we don't wanna rely on flawed data um, for our risk indicators. Step three combines the results of our analysis from steps one and step two. And that helps us figure out uh, which uh, risk indicators we actually should be looking at for our risk assessment. So this is a, an example here in the table. I know there's a lot of information here, but it's just a, a preview of what our results might look like. Um, you know, you've got the scores for each indicator and that four column on the right is telling us, should we be considering this indicator? In some cases, it's gonna be a strong yes. You should, we should be thinking about including it. Um, other cases, it's going to be a no or maybe a future. Um, future ones are those that, uh, you know, scored well on applicability, but we just don't have um, good data fitness there. So we need to uh, create some better data collection strategies from the water board in order to get that data to a point where we can actually use it in the future. So more of this is gonna come um, in just a few weeks. We're putting together our white paper now. We've been doing our analysis on all 118 indicators. So I encourage you to participate on our October 2nd webinar um, where we dive into the results of our analysis and we have some recommendations on what we think uh, should be the final list of indicators used. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, Amanda or others, you want to um, kickstart the discussion?
So I think, um, I think, uh, Kristen, we were going to um, probably do the discussion just after the your presentation. So it looks I have more slides in my deck. Do you? Okay, I do. I have more slides, so I can keep going. Yeah, I think we should just Big keep going. And then, um, these this will just let people know this is the discussion topic that we're planning on discussing after your presentation. But so one of the questions we'll get to are what are the three most important things to make a water system at risk? Got it. All right, let's keep going. I'm so excited um, to come back to these discussion topics and hear your thoughts. Um, so that was our, our update on the risk assessment. Um, now I wanna dive into our affordability assessment. And so our affordability assessment, uh, again, we're looking at uh, trying to determine what uh, communities are um, experiencing water rates that may be unaffordable. Now, the water board and the water sector in general nationwide um, for years, decades really, has been using a metric called uh, percent median household income to measure community and household affordability. Um, and you, you, it should be familiar to you, it was what we used in the last fund expenditure plan to do our affordability assessment. Um, you know, there's been, again, statewide uh, and across the nation, EPA and Congress, a recognition that percent median household income um, does have some limitations in, in really uh, identifying where some communities and households are struggling with affordability. And so our desire has been to explore alternative metrics and thresholds for affordability that account for household affordability, community affordability, and financial capacity and a water system's financial capacity. So a lot that we're trying to do here. And, you know, I, I like to kind of step back sometimes when we talk about affordability, because it's a very large umbrella topic area. And so, and I'm a very visual person, so I hope that this next um, little infographic will help you. But when we're talking about measuring affordability, right, I like to think about it in terms of different, um, different ways to measure things, right? So. You can have one metric like this that may be weight. Um, and we're trying to think about, um, you know, what does it mean to be unaffordable? And right now, this is, we use one metric. We have percent median household income as our one metric. But there could be other metrics out there um, that are looking at affordability from different angles. And so these are just some examples. And sometimes, what you can do is uh, have a combined assessment um, for looking at affordability from multiple different angles. And so I like to think about it kind of this way in my head when I, when I think about how do you measure affordability. You don't need to rely on just one metric, you can utilize more than one. What we've been doing through our risk assessment work is identifying alternative affordability metrics um, so you will be bouncing around terminology, but it, it is all the same thing. It's a metric is a metric. Um, we have our risk indicator metric and we have our affordability metrics and they're all um, similar. So what we've done in our risk assessment work again is identify 22 possible affordability metrics. This is just a snapshot on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, what we're doing through our risk assessment work is evaluating these metrics um, looking at the, again, the applicability and that data coverage piece, which is helping us narrow down what our metrics might be. This is gonna help us identify which metrics we could use in our affordability assessment as well. So both of these methodologies are, are tied together through this metric. And if you remember that infographic I showed you um, at the very beginning of this presentation, this is how they tie together. Again, if you're interested at looking um, deeply into all of the ones that we've identified so far, please take a look at our white paper and we've provided the hyperlink here. Now, identifying ways to measure affordability um, is an, is a, it's not as difficult as setting thresholds. And so what's the difference between the two? So the way I like to think about it is your affordability measurement, right? Is, is this measuring cup, um, it's a scale but you get a number out of that, right? You might be at, at tick line number two here on the measuring cup, or you might be at four inches here on metric three. But what does that tell you? Um, it doesn't really tell you much in terms of affordability until you apply a threshold to it. And so, you know, at this point, 
it becomes unaffordable. You know, water rates or poverty level indicates that we're hitting a threshold where unaffordability occurs. And we've been using within the water board um, a one and a half percent MHI threshold. And EPA has used two and a half percent in the past. So there are some thresholds that exist already for certain metrics, but for other metrics, thresholds do not exist. And we want to be very thoughtful about how we determine our threshold for our affordability metrics. We could be, depending on which metrics we choose, we could have one line, you know, one metric um, and one threshold like we do for MHI. Or if we're doing some sort of combined assessment, you're going to have a little bit more of a complicated threshold applied there. And so because of the timeline on how we're developing our, um, our indicators for our risk assessment and identifying these possible metrics, it doesn't give us much time between choosing our metrics and then determining a threshold by the end of the year. And so for this next year, what we're going to be doing is still utilize the percent MHI metrics. Um, but over the next year, we're going to be working with stakeholders, um, internal and external, to come up with an appropriate threshold for the new metrics that we identify this year. And I'm happy to, to dive into that a little bit further. Um, so again, for our affordability assessment, if you're interested in what metrics are we, um, are we going to be recommending, tune in for our October 2nd webinar. We would love to hear your feedback and thoughts on those metrics. And again, we're not the only ones who are looking in at affordability measurement and thresholds. Um, CPUC, USPA, other states around the, the country are looking at different ways of measuring affordability and methodologies for setting thresholds. And so we're trying to also connect with those groups as well to learn from them and see how we can align some of our, our understanding there. And again, we're going to have a discussion topic on affordability and happy to dive in with you guys on that. And then last but not least, um, we have our cost assessment methodology. Um, again, we are looking at how much would it cost for us to uh, address some of the challenges that are being faced by our at-risk systems and our systems that are out of compliance. And we're working again with UCLA and our subcontractors on developing that methodology. We just had a webinar a few weeks ago on this topic. So I encourage you to check out um, our SAFER website where we're gonna be posting the recording from that webinar. And you can access the white paper uh, that provides a, an overview of that methodology. This is a, a very high level um, process diagram for that methodology on how we're gonna be um, estimating the costs. And I'm not gonna dive into it here because it gets quite complicated. And I think we're running out of time but always happy to discuss more um, what we're doing to uh, estimate costs for, um, for our systems. You've heard about our timeline. Um, this is just it in another form. We've got a number of uh, webinars coming up between now and the spring of next year, but really between now and December is the crunch time for us in developing our methodologies for these assessments. Um, I really encourage you all to uh, register for these webinars, to participate and, and be vocal. Let us know what your thoughts are. Um, we want to incorporate um, as much public feedback and recommendations into our methodology as possible. And with that, I think we're going to go into the discussion questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Kristen. You and your team are doing a whole lot over there, so we appreciate that. Um, so folks, we're going to take a really quick break and kind of reconvene as uh, so like five minute break and we'll come back and then we're going to go into our breakout room. So if you want to be back here at from my clock, it's 1013. So 1018, please.
All right, welcome back everyone. Um, just to let you know, we are going to be starting the breakout group discussions and you'll have um, some uh, folks uh, from the water boards will be there to facilitate and do some note taking. And then we'll also have um, some of the technical staff on in the breakout groups to answer any questions because I know there was a lot of information that we went over and we wanna make sure that we have time to discuss. So, um, we're going to be starting the breakout room shortly. If you can just join the group when it pops up, that would be great. And sorry, folks, it looks like we're having a little bit of a technical issue on the back end. So if you can just bear with us, we'll send you into those breakout rooms really shortly.
accessible and affordable drinking water. So with that in mind, I'm wondering if anyone has any immediate thoughts on this question or even comments or clarifying questions about this. Well, I have a, I have a comment. Um, I'm here from Pitsley, California in Tulare County and um, we've had, you know, problems with our water. I wasn't here in 2010, but I understand that um, they were facing, tr trying to get a grant at that point and they were able to get it. Now, they just, I believe, got another grant and it seems as if though, well, the people here in town feel like, you know, they're, they're not, the people that own the water system are not listening to them and that they don't even wanna bother to try to get active in doing anything or trying to do anything because they say, you know, it's just always been that way and it's not gonna change anything. And that's very sad. Um, I'm trying, and it's it's a little bit harder now with COVID that we can't even have meetings. And so, yeah, that's that's one of my concerns. And I, I've also um, tried to let them know that um, the, about the meetings, but I think a lot of them have a challenge of being able to go on Zoom, plus um, the fact that we have problems with internet access here in Pixley. And um, so I feel like uh, I wish that our water system was more, was that we're transparent with us and um, friendly to try to communicate with us. That would be a step forward. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Michelle. It looked like you wanted to say something. Well, I, I was going to say, I, I thought there was a technical, and, and I didn't know if Jay was going to say anything. I thought there was recently a technical assistant um, ask for that community to help with community engagement. Um, I, I would have to go back and be sure, but I, I believe that was part of it. So, um, you know, that. I, uh, you know, we can talk about it afterwards if, if you want to. Joe, do you have anything on that? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know offhand. I'd have to get back to them. But it sounds like Camille was suggesting like one risk factor is when there's uh, maybe lack of um, community engagement or outreach from the leaders of the water system them, themselves. Right. Yeah, I think that's an accurate reflection of one of my concerns. I do think it's helpful to think of public participation. I know it's not normally one of the metrics people consider for an at-risk system, mm -hmm. but I have noticed that systems where the board starts to kind of stop communication with the community or there's it becomes increasingly harder to get answers, it's usually yeah. a leader of like bigger management problems that are going to, to come to bear. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it wouldn't be that hard to measure, right? It's like Brown Act compliance, kind of. I mean, that's not all of it, but that would be one way to look at it. Yeah, that it could be. I'm thinking of also, oh gosh, I've forgotten its name. Is it the Central Basin Water District? The one that just fired all its staff? Um, because they refused, I think it was like two weeks ago, they fired all the staff for failure to comply with unlawful orders. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm thinking now of like a number of systems we've worked with and usually things start to go badly when the board starts closing off public access to information and starts firing kind of the, or, or not firing, but starts removing the checks and balances that might otherwise ensure that the system is operating in a transparent manner. Great, thank you. Is there a place where you can find Board Act or Brown Act compliance in a database type? I wouldn't think so, but I'm just curious. I do, do not know. No, I don't think so. No. I mean, if you if the board were looking at a specific system, I guess it, it makes it kind of difficult for like screening. But if you were looking at doing more investigation to, into a, how a system is operating, you could ask for say six months of agendas or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not posted anywhere. There's not a database. I wish there were. It sounds like Elena was going to say something though. Uh, that's exactly um, what it is, you know, that we don't, uh, 
they do post it, I believe, at the store, but, you know, ahead of time, um, we're not able to have any kind of information. And uh, even before that, before COVID, we would go to attend the meetings. And one of the suggestions I had made was that they could, if they could get a bigger place, because there was only like room for the board and maybe if, if possible, eight seats. And they said, oh, we'll just set a few chairs. And so, you know, uh, that that uh, in itself also um, discourages the community from getting involved. Yeah, and you brought up such a great point, Elena, which is also COVID has made us all go to Zoom and there's a massive um, internet gap or digital gap for rural communities in particular. And so even if folks had the technological capacity to call in or to I don't know, use their iPhone and the Zoom app on their iPhone or smartphone. Um, oftentimes they don't have strong enough internet to, or even cell phone service, to be honest. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, these are great points. So, Kajal, be sure you're taking oh. notes. <laughs> and then, Michael, sorry, I look like I cut you off. Did you want to add something? Oh, uh, not specifically on this risk factor, but I think it is an important one. I think I'm just trying to think through, um, I don't know, it just seems like a lot of the systems we work with, uh, like the, the indicators that staff are looking at in the white paper generally seem good, but it almost seems to overcomplicate the issue in a lot of cases where if you look at, say, is it a water system serving a DAC with fewer than 200 connections with under whatever the proper reserves? And it seems like it's enough probably in most cases to determine this is an at-risk water system. That seems to capture most of the systems that I think we're most concerned about. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen an at-risk system that had reserves. Right, I think I'm thinking of Tuleyville. I think they have eighteen thousand dollars in the their checking account, and no reserve account. Like that seems like it's enough to end the inquiry and say, okay, this is an at-risk water system. <laughs> I don't know if there's kind of an off-ramp or something, or or like if there are these three factors, then you're at risk and we'll consider other factors for other systems. But it seems like that there are just a couple things to look at that would capture most of these. And Elena, was there anything else you wanted to add to this point? It looks like you're on mute. Um, that's it for now. Okay, great. Did anyone else want to to add any points? Um, State Water Board staff, I know there's a there's a heck of a lot of us on here. So if any of you all want to add a point, feel free. I guess my only thought on that is that I think fifty percent of our water systems have less than a hundred connections. And so, and, and I don't remember for 200, but it would still like just, it's, it's a huge number of water systems. I mean, that's not been including DAC and, and reserves, but are, your point is well made, but I, I do, it is still a big world, a, a big universe out there with 200. Yeah, question about the septic tank, proximity to the septic tank indicator um, is the thought they're looking at lots that are too small to have both a well and a septic tank on them? Or is, I guess not, because that's, you're not looking at domestic wells here, right? Uh, well, no, it's actually lots of times if there is a problem with the well construction and there's, there's oftentimes a problem with the septic. And so then you end up getting septic feeding a well. Okay, so the concern there is bacteria, not nitrate? Okay. Well, I mean, it could be either, but 
Yeah, I was just thinking if it's if the focus is nitrate, their proximity to ag is probably a better indicator. Dairies and agriculture. Yeah. Right. Yeah, thank you all so much for, for uh, chiming in on this discussion topic. Uh, last call for anything on this topic. If not, we will move on to the next question. All right, hearing none. Here is the next question. Let's take a look. So um, discussion topic two, the affordability assessment. We'll spend about 12 to 15 minutes on this topic. Um, so as we heard earlier in today's presentation, the Division of Drinking Water will be developing an alternative approach for measuring household and community affordability. And I can flip back to some of those slides if that would be helpful for y'all. So the question is, like, what does it mean for water to be affordable to customers of a water system? Don't all jump out at once. <laughs> I think Michael and I are more likely to wait to see if Elena has anything to say because otherwise we'll dominate the conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, Elena. Elena, I saw you were unmuted and now you're muted again. Okay, could it be, uh, I would, uh, what really stands out to me is the demographic uh, demographics of the community. For example, here it's a lot of uh, dairies and um, pretty much that's it, dairies and farm work. And um, as we know, they work seasonally and um, by the time they go to work, they owe a lot of money by the time they, you know, and then they just plain catch up all the time. Um, taking into account um, their, the range of um, income, that would be, I think, a good place to start. And um, for our community, it's, uh, it's a very low, very low income. And um, so I think that that's what mainly stands out to me. Yeah, great point, Elena. So just to what I heard is maybe looking at the income ranges of the customers in the waters of the water system. Yes. Okay, great. Did anyone else want to comment? Yeah, just uh, go ahead. Go ahead and like that. I was just gonna echo Elena there a little bit. I think one important point you made, Elena, is that median household income or average income sometimes masks kind of this income disparity when you have a community like Pixley where there are wealthy or, or relatively wealthy dairy owners that are customers of a water system and then you have on the under, other end of the spectrum farm workers that aren't making a lot of money sometimes median or average doesn't capture that so I'm glad that staff are trying to look at some other indicators like Deep poverty, I, I've seen suggested um, in other contexts, contexts, looking at the percentage of customers paying more than a certain threshold of their income, of actual household income rather than median. So if you have 20 or 30% of a community that can't afford a water rate, then that seems to be an indicator of unaffordability along the lines of what I think Elena was capturing. Yeah, I think the other thing she brought up that's really important is the role of seasonal unemployment. Um, and just that there are, if we look at costs over the, or percentage of cost over the course of the year, we may be missing points of time where affordability could take a nosedive because all of a sudden there's no income coming in. I believe, especially in the Pixley area, but I think this is true for most of rural low income so the rural low-income San Joaquin Valley, and I believe the Coachella Valley, is that you have unemployment rates of as high as 30 to 40 percent um, when you're off the agricultural calendar, and so it can be pretty severe. 
I think the other thing that will be difficult to track but is important to consider when we think about water being affordable is not the rate that individuals are paying, but the total burden um, of obtaining safe water, just because there's such a significant amount of replacement water that, that is purchased in these areas. I think we have to take into account any any bottled water or other expenditures on replacement water in addition to whatever rate someone is paying their water system. Yeah, those are great points. Did any uh, state water board staff want to chime in? Yeah, hi, this is Joe. I actually have a question maybe um, you know, for the advisory group members who've been thinking about this. Um, but I wonder, how, how do you think about sort of the standard of living in a given area? You know, because when we start getting into more urban setting, you know, there might be a, uh, you know, it, even if the poverty rate were comparatively similar between an urban and rural area, your housing costs are much higher in that urban area what's affordable for water or sewer or anything else is going to be much different right so that and and i apologize to michelle i haven't had a chance to read the white papers your staff prepared so maybe you guys could address that but that seems like a some you know that seems like a metric I, and i don't know how that gets reported that would integrate a number of um affordability issues, right? Because people just don't pay for water. They're trying to pay for housing and food and all sorts okay. of other things, other utilities. Yeah, I don't know, Camille or Elena, if you have a good metric there. I, I'm, I seem to recall that there is data on average costs by, I think by census tract of basic necessities like housing and food. So that does seem like data that's available. I'm just trying to remember what the specific data source is. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think the I think BLS keeps track of this too. The, sorry, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, in addition to the American Community Survey, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics surveys more, more frequently. Um, and it's true that they have like a, a basic necessities bundle there are some elements in the bundle that I think are underweighted or overweighted. Um, so housing tends to be underweighted in California because it's a, a federal um, standard. But I do think it might be helpful to consider whether water should be examined as a percentage of total household income or whether it should be examined in the context of total basic necessities. And I, d I don't know if one measure is better or worse, but it does strike me that housing does tend to be significantly higher. For example, in Los Angeles, you're going to be paying really high housing costs and you may also have really high water burdens when you combine both together. The EnviroScreen does a really good job of proxying for this in the context of health disparities. And I don't know if that could be a useful um, data set, I guess, to use to think about the intensity of a burden. It's difficult because in the rural context, housing may or may not be um, less expensive. I mean, it's objectively less expensive than the coast, but when you compare it to local economic activity, you actually end up with very similar disparities. And so it might also make sense to consider more localized metrics that take into account the fact that this it, it's not helpful necessarily to look across the state and average uh, the coast essentially with the inland areas because the cost of living is so significantly different. But I'm just thinking of communities like, like Lanier or Kentua Creek where people are paying over $200 a month and that's pretty consistent with folks who are in um, really difficult failing water systems in Los Angeles as well. They're often paying around $200 a month. And so even though the total cost of housing is quite high, incomes tend to be slightly higher also. So there would have to be some kind of geographic norming to, to capture those disparities. Can I ask, I mean, I, I have a further question. You know, one of the 
things that our our group is struggling with a little bit is um, whether we try and you know get affordability not perfect and but get something in for this year or whether we really spend more time thinking about it um, and and getting a lot of public engagement around it so you know I, I don't know if the members if we even have time it's a, but you know that's something I know I would like feedback on yeah, is this, we have a couple minutes would okay. it make sense for us to borrow from some of the comment letters and the because there was so much work done and so much like careful thought put into the letters around the creation of an affordability program and fund. Okay. Yeah, and the Leary proceeding. I was gonna say, I can forward around our comments. We had joint comments with Pacific Institute and Community Water Center and um, like a Laura Feinstein spent a lot of time on um, putting together a lot of really good ideas in those comments. Uh, I'm sure you've you've had access to them, Michelle, but if there's elements that are still missing after that, I, th I think it would be helpful for us to come back and talk about what that could be. Um, speaking personally, I think it's important to at least have an affordability placeholder, even if we don't have, a, a, even if the, the metric is in process, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have an imperfect standard in the first year than no standard on an affordability. But Laura did write like, oh gosh, it was like a 200 page letter. Um, but it was very thoughtful and it included a lot of um, engagement with the idea of the fact that there are these huge regional differences in cost of living, but also in, in reliability of employment. She is, I mean, she is on our team, so I'll definitely. Oh, okay. perfect. I didn't realize. Yeah, she's, uh, um, you know, at least Pacific Institute was. So, Yay, know. congrats. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, when I say she was on our team, she was one of the subcontractors with UCLA. Oh, no, that's what right. I asked when you said she was on your team. <laughs> like, thank you. I don't want to derail us, but. Yeah, I'd say something. I mean, I think we already have a placeholder of 1.5, and that's very, very imperfect. I think spending some time trying to get that better, knowing that we're probably never going to have a perfect definition, um, but I would definitely commit time to that. Yeah, so I think, Michelle, your, your question is kind of, do, do we take another incremental step, right? That might be better, but not where we want to go. Yeah. Versus spending the time getting to where we want to get to, right? And maybe having that less than perfect interim measure for for another year, right? That's that is the question. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's how I understood it too, Michelle. I would rather have an imperfect interim than nothing. I don't know if others feel the same. That's that's just. Yeah, I tend to agree. Unless I mean, if we started stakeholder processes and got to a, a really good metric that everybody was comfortable with in a shorter amount of time than we, I would think. I mean, that's great. But, okay. um, yeah, I'd agree with Camille. All right, and Elena, did you want to add anything to this um, discussion topic? And if not, we'll head on to the next one. No, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much for uh, those insightful comments. I am now going to switch to the next slide. Our last discussion topic for this breakout group is water system financial ability. So again, during this morning's presentation, uh, you saw that the Division of Drinking Water is identifying metrics that will help determine if a water system is at risk of failing to provide safe, accessible, and affordable drinking water. So a water system's ability to finance necessary upgrades is an at-risk metric. So the question is, what does it mean for water systems to have the financial ability to operate reliably both now and into the future? This is a hard one, I know. <laughs> I bet Joe and I have lots of thoughts, but we're supposed to be listening. 
Well, the part that I always get nervous about, so I, I think it's valuable for, for all systems to have reserves. I know that's the goal is that can they operate if there's an emergency or a disaster. Um, but that said, I would be really surprised if most, I would be surprised to see if there's even a majority of water systems that have adequate reserves for a situation like that. And with the exception of kind of the very big systems like East Bay Municipal Utility District or LA Department of Water and Power, um, it seems that the, the majority of water systems are small systems and those systems seem structurally build up their reserves to a level that would be financially secure. But yeah, I don't know. I think the difficulty with the financial ability is just that many of them have service boundaries that are so small that they're set up to be financially incapable. Like they're structurally, it becomes structurally impossible for them to be able to keep up with the cost of operations. Although, I mean, I agree, Camille, but shouldn't that mean that they are at risk and we should be looking at ways to get them consolidated? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do think that means they're at risk. I guess my my fear is that sometimes I think the focus on the reser on reserves just is over inclusive of systems. So I think there are systems that are at very high risk. I guess at risk is a spectrum to me. And there are some systems that are small and structurally never going to be quite financially, um, like they won't be running deficits, but they're not gonna be saving very much either, if that makes sense. But are also probably okay to run like that for a while. Like they probably won't have a disaster anytime soon. But there are other systems that are in areas where they're highly likely to have some kind of contamination or infrastructure disaster or natural disaster from a fire or some other kind of like major issue and are also financially unreliable. And so I, I think it's true that we should consider financial ability as an at-risk indicator, but I do think there needs to be a little bit of gradation there to be able to distinguish between who is the highest at risk on the finance um, issue and who isn't. And then there, we're gonna have some systems that are not consolidatable, but are also set up financially to never be able to like reach financial security. Or yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess one thing I'm trying to think of, and I think this is along the same lines, is how much we should take into consideration the available uh, availability of state and federal funding if uh, say a well goes down and it's a small system serving a disadvantaged community. And I know that's not the ideal, but on the other hand, it's also the reality of a lot of systems. Um, I don't know if Camille or Michelle or Joe, if you have thoughts there. Yeah, I was gonna observe. So, um, you know, when we, when we get um, uh, uh, applications for our funding and a lot of times there are water rate studies and other things and I'm starting to you know look at those details and one of the things that I've seen is even when um, a capital improvement plan is prepared or and a look at sort of what water rates should be some some systems are looking at well I'm going to count on getting 90 percent grant for my capital project and I'm like wow <laughs> you're pretty confident <laughs> You know, um, so I think it's a it's a great question. And, you know, to, to Camille's point there, there's sort of like three things that we look at in terms of reserves. One is the emergency, one is for ongoing O&M, and then, then there's, uh, you know, putting away money for your capital improvement. So it's like you, you're looking at all, you want to look at all three of those and, and see what, um, you know, your financial situation is. But it's a super question. I I, I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm more like uh, conservative in in my own investment approaches, so I wouldn't necessarily count on, uh, yeah, gosh, I'm going to get free money for my system indefinitely into the future, right? Uh, you may get one project funded now, and let's say it's got a you know 20, 30 year useful life. Uh, that gives you 20, 30 years to start socking some money away, right? Or are you going to count on the same level of grant funding of being available 20 or 30 years from now. 
think it's a real good question that also plays into that whole affordability issue as well, right? Yeah, because so I, so I'm like you, Joe. I'm very risk averse on and and very conservative in how I personally approach financing stuff. Um, but the other thing that I've noticed, so I'm thinking of two small systems I work with. Michelle is familiar with both of them. One is down in um, the Lake Isabella region, and they actually have a fairly decent operational reserve, um, but not it's not anywhere near adequate if they had to do ongoing operation, like ongoing maintenance of their infrastructure, and certainly not enough if they had an emergency. And then I'm thinking of another system that's up in Sonoma County that doesn't have either, but in the past has been able to address emergencies because they have a number of members who are contractors and who donate their labor. So what ends up happening is that the community will then like crowdfund money for the supplies, but the labor and all the additional cost is taken care of. And that sort of stuff is not well captured in a budget. And I'm, I don't think that either approach, I mean, both are certainly at risk financially, but that's very different to me than a system that never is able to save anything and never has a reserve and has no plan except maybe the state will, will be able to come and help us out. Um, but it, it, you're absolutely right that it also goes back to affordability because most of the systems I see that are at risk and don't have reserves also cannot raise their rates because their rates are usually very, very high. Or if they're not high, they're in an area where uh, local residents or customers of the service, depending on how it's structured, can't literally cannot afford like a quarter extra. We're paying 25 cents extra every month or even a dollar more every month. So that was not a solution, but a long rant on how complicated it is. Yeah, when you were talking, Joe, I was thinking of a study I read a while back about how cuts in state revolving fund funding from the federal government was tied pretty closely with um, increasing water unaffordability. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll try to look up that study, but it does seem relevant and I don't know how to answer it. I mean, there are other things, uh, you know, just because we've been diving into this, just some other things for you guys to think about, because, uh, you know, the, all that, what you've all said are good points. We also have talked about like fiscal policies, you know, um, asset management, what is the, what is the um, quality of their infrastructure? What is the age of their infrastructure? Um, you know, there are some other things there too. I don't know, just to maybe jog thoughts or, um, and yeah, certainly we don't wanna go from unsafe to unaffordable. That's always part of it too. Yeah, I think it's hard for advocates because we always have Lanier in the back of our mind. Yes, okay. Thank you all for those points. Elena, sorry to keep picking on you, but if you want to uh, add anything, feel free. If not, we're going to start to wrap up. Sorry, uh, yeah, we can just go ahead and start to wrap up. Okay, yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have any um, final points on this topic before we start to summarize what we talked about? No, all right. So um, just as a reminder, Elena, you are going to be our reporter for the group, so um, at the end of this, when we all get brought back to the bigger group, Elena, we're going to ask that you uh, share with the group what some of our main points were. So if you want to okay. go ahead and run those by us, we have Kajal on the line too, who's been taking notes so she can help uh, jot our memories if we forget. <laughs> okay. Um, on topic one, at risk, um, uh, First of all, the concern of communications with the, um, the board and the community is a concern because, um, you know, they need to be more, um, we don't lose like sight of what's going on and, and that there is anything going on, that there is uh, 
issues are being dealt with. And um, one of the things that um, was brought up was possibly uh, that it would be good to have uh, some information on the history of their um, meetings for some months. And that would be really good. Um, uh, I think that if we could communicate better to the community, they would come and be more um, proactive in the situation and um, possibly just putting our heads together would help um, the situation. But at this point, uh, it's just not happening. Um, that's what I got out of that, I'm sorry. Oh, no need to apologize, that's great. Okay, did anyone wanna add points to that to make sure that we report that back to the bigger group? No, nope. it sounds like Elena, you got it. Awesome job. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Yeah. I write, I write slow, so that's a little hard and then I'm trying to hear at the same time. And uh, on topic two on affordability, um, we thought uh, that income ranges were um, a good factor to look at when it came to uh, affordability. Um, like as a matter of like, what do you have, for example, uh, there aren't very many places to work here. It's just uh, dairy and um, also um, farm work. And that uh, is very low income. Well, dairy is not as much, but that um, farm work is limited, both uh, the fact that it's temporarily, or should I say um, seasonal. And um, so, and then we'll, we'll add that factor also that with COVID, there was also a lot of, um, times when people couldn't work, I have, I believe they were off work like almost half of this, the beginning of this year. And that made it hard. Um, and um, that one thing we could consider would be um, um, replacement water like bottled or uh, that, that could help us out because it is expensive to buy bottled water. Um, most people, that's a burden. It's a luxury, in fact, if they can afford it in this area. Yeah, and it, it can vary because uh, depending on the community, um, taking into account the rents, uh, the costs of living, other, other factors that um, like, okay, we have water, we got to pay for it, utilities and all that. And rents vary in different communities. And, um, you know, we, uh, Michelle made a comment that we could take account of the letters content and uh, look at regional differences in stats. And that's a good idea. I, I really think that it is um, so we could have a more accurate account, but um, the, these communities are not even medium, they're, they're poverty, below poverty. Um, these small communities here that I'm, I'm aware of in Tulare County, uh, it's, it's very hard to afford it, and if not impossible. Lima, sorry to interrupt. It looks like we have seven seconds left. So you are doing okay. a fantastic job. I think you've got all our points. We will see you all back. All right, looks like we are bringing back everyone from the breakout groups. And I hope that we haven't lost anyone along the way. So I'll just give another 30 seconds or so.
and then we'll get started on our um, report back. And just as a reminder, if you are using interpretation settings or if you're hearing um, two different languages going on at once, you're going to want to be sure to select your language. It should be at the bottom right of your screen and it looks like a globe. And then you can select your language from there. You're going to want to make sure to, that you mute your original audio as well. All right. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to spend some time here reporting and feeding back. So we had, I believe, three groups today. And we're going to ask that each group's reporter takes about three minutes or so to share the following information from their breakout session. So a couple questions and prompts we have here. What were your group's top takeaways? Were there any areas of consensus or conflict? Was there any feedback that was brought up in your group? And were there any questions that came up? You don't have to cover all of these, but if you'd like to, feel free. So we're going to start with group number one. And I believe, Katie, you were the reporter. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so for the first question, question about what are the three most important things that make a water system at risk. Uh, I think our group brought up similar elements about water quality, uh, including uh, water, both MCLs and other elements that make people willing to use the water, uh, distribution system pressure. Uh, also things came up about TMF, uh, rate structures, financial viability, having a good CIP or asset management program, and um, being able to consistently meet demands and replace infrastructure. Uh, a big discussion topic on this for us was the uh, definition of an at-risk system, or, or the terminology, I would say, of at risk, and um, wanting to be careful about the fact that uh, some systems manage their systems to stay below the MCLs and have been able to consistently manage to provide uh, water that meets MCLs and don't want to feel like they're being penalized by being called an at-risk system. So I think it's trying to find the balance of uh, those who are managing well but may have a number of these attributes uh, or indicators, but also uh, be, for being able to proactively identify those who truly are in need of assistance or um, having trouble managing their system. So, so that was a, a big discussion topic for our group is, is how, how you find that balance. Uh, for the second question, uh, what does it mean for water to be affordable for customers of a water system? Uh, our group had a lot of discussion around the distinction about uh, providing compliant water at the lowest cost possible, so the system level expenses and true cost to provide water versus individual household, individual household affordability and ability for individuals to pay. Uh, we had some discussion about economies of lack of economies of scale for systems that are uh, communities that are very small and isolated and the challenges of not having as many households to spread those costs over. Uh, and um, we also had a lot of discussion about the, the distinction of finding how to measure the thresholds versus how to mitigate the challenge. So um, Kristen brought up that, you know, here we were really talking about metrics and, and things that we could, data that we could be looking at to help identify what the issue is. And then later DFA would use the results of that analysis. So, so I think our group spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, that dis and, and, and talk about those distinctions. And then um, we had a, lo a lot of discussion around uh, 
customer charge metrics and and I think a very uh, deliberate use of the term of customer charges versus rates because we, were, we also our, our group had a lot of concern about things that costs that could shift between uh, rates and fees and taxes to artificially drive down rates versus showing true financial sustainability. Um, and then on the third question about what does it mean for water systems to have the financial ability to operate reliably now and in the future. Uh, again, the topic of customer charge structures came up and how challenging it can be for a small system to have affordable rates while being financially viable and, and having a larger customer base to provide more financial sustainability, uh, looking at proactive maintenance on the system versus deferred expenditures. Uh, over overlaying affordability with recouping costs. And um, Ava brought up uh, that especially in the environment that we are now, and there are small systems that have their rate structures set up to barely cover costs. And you layer on top of that, the current challenge of uh, affordability with uh, COVID and, and lost, lost revenues and shut off moratoriums and that exacerbates the challenges of a water system to be able to uh, pay their bills or, and individuals to pay their bills and um, highlights the importance of having reserves and a good financial system in place. Uh, and then in this group, in this topic, also our group discussed a lot about reporting and trying to gather information. The EAR electronic annual report came up uh, a number of times and, and uh, how the state Board can look for opportunities to utilize information that is already being reported to them in other manners. So, so I think there is still uh, more that needs to be discussed on this topic about making sure that the in, in trying to get the right data to answer some of these questions that it isn't shifting more burden onto utilities to report more things if, if there's already avenues to get that information. But I think that um, we didn't have enough time to really understand what data is available. So that's probably ongoing discussion. Um, anyone else from my group? Did I miss anything? I think you did a good job, Katie. Woo, go Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. All right, we're gonna move on to our next breakout group. Uh, I believe the reporter was Sergio and this breakout group took place predominantly in Spanish. So Sergio, if you'd like to give your feedback in Spanish, you can do that. If you'd like to give your feedback in English, we can try and have our one of our interpreters hop on and, and um, translate. So go ahead, Sergio, the mic is yours. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, we did, we did a, an assessment of, of, of in three particular areas. And the three areas have uh, a, uh, some serious takeaways, and one of them is is, is the um, uh, the concern of um, maintaining an adequate levels of quality uh, water that is within the the required uh, MCA, MCL. Um, the other one is the concern about uh, the family's ability to afford uh, the rates imposed by uh, the water systems. And the third one uh, that we came out as a big takeaway is um, the concern about the ca financial capacity that, that uh, water systems actually have to make sure that they are uh, up to code and are able to keep up with the maintenance and operations of the system. So those were the most, most uh, the biggest uh, takeaway. Um, what we actually arrived as common denominators on these three areas um, was pretty evident. Um, the system definitely need to actually have the capacity uh, for maintenance. Um, uh, that includes just to have uh, ongoing water testing um, to actually provide adequate upgrades when it's needed. Um, that requires the ability to actually bring uh, uh, capital investments to, to do those upgrades and to have adequate levels of maintenance. Those are the 
the big consensus areas that we have when it comes to uh, quality of, of, of drinking water. When it comes to the cost feasibility, um, we concluded that um, the, uh, the pandemic has made things worse because many people are already uh, uh, relying on unemployment and some of the people have already exhausted those and they don't have any means to pay these, these, uh, uh, these bills, these utilities. So we actually came out with a consensus that uh, there gotta be a, a government plan where families can apply for subsidies, either uh, with the local small water system or through a, a particular uh, municipal uh, entity. Uh, there is an incredible need, especially now where the majority of disadvantaged communities work on the fields, they are farm workers, they are super essential workers. And it's time that uh, for the government to step up and provide these adequate resources uh, so that they don't have any issues with, uh, with any accumulation of death especially when it comes to utilities. Um, another critical uh, thing that actually we came out as a consensus is that because of the pandemic, a lot of people is actually now taking classes remotely for, for their uh, kids and students. And that has created an additional burden to the families because many families don't have uh, adequate access to internet. So they have to actually take an additional uh, bill to, to pay for that kind of a new utility on top of what is already, um, you know, uh, being uh, challenged. So that's another critical thing. They need to provide more assistance through subsidies um, for uh, these unexpected challenges. And the, the last one is when it comes to our consensus is that is with the financial capacity, um, many water systems are too small to sustain. And the more users that the water system have, the better the financial capacity of the system to provide adequate drinking, uh, quality drinking water. Um, the consensus was that uh, a good strategy is to consolidate, just to combine different small water system and consolidate to a big one. So you have more user, you have more capacity, you have more technical capacity, most, most importantly, but also, the capacity to attract uh, capital investment so that adequate improvements and upgrades to the system can take place. Um, many of them are already um, uh, creating that, that capacity through more training, uh, education, which include budgeting uh, and, and how the communities need to understand also how, long, uh, how much does it take for a system to function. Once again, the cases are different when you have a small water systems. Um, uh, you know, the cost of, of, of maintenance is, is higher. We got some examples that some systems are paying over $100 uh, to maintain the water system. Um, in addition to that, uh, the cost of having uh, specific operators to actually go and, and, and test the water and make, making sure that all the system treatment systems are working properly. Uh, but at the same time, um, it come the, uh, 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 which is coming for the next uh, feedback is that another alternative will be to uh, have operators that are taking care of different systems to reduce the expenses, for example, uh, for those small systems. Um, there was no specific questions that I can uh, come up, but I will give the opportunity to the members of the group if they would like to add up to any other further comments. Thank you for that, Sergio. So we'll give a couple seconds if anyone else in Sergio's group wanted to add. I think he covered it pretty well. All right, great job. We have um, great reporters today, the A team. All right, so last but most certainly not least, we have Elena Saldivar, who was the reporter for the final breakout group. Elena, the mic is yours. Okay, hello everybody. Um, uh, we were, uh, as far as topic one, we discussed uh, about the address factor and um, the concern of our, our communities is that um, 
well, us in particular, which is Pixley, um, the lack of transparency from our water system. Uh, you know, we don't get a lot of information. We are not made feel, we don't feel like we are welcomed uh, in the meetings because there's not, there was no, not enough room there. And now, um, we, of course, with COVID, we have the communication gap because um, we have to um, keep in contact through the internet, you know, and um, it's very difficult. One, for one thing, we don't have good access to it. And for another, um, it's something that people cannot afford. Um, we, um, I wondered if uh, it was uh, possible for the board to um, do any assessments as far as um, what our water system is doing, because of, as I say, they're not transparent with us and uh, we're not finding out a lot of things. Yes, they do post their uh, meeting minutes after the fact, but um, it's most people can't, um, you know, they're farm workers and all that, and they're not able to, um, understand and um, possibly, I don't know, they could uh, start sending out letters, giving them some type of information that would be good, you know, because this, the idea right now that the community has is, uh, you know, we're, we're here, we're, we don't have good affordable drinking water or safe water, but this is how it's gonna be and this is how it's always gonna be. And um, I think we, we should be able to work together as far as that. And I hope that we can reach that place. And um, okay, then uh, topic two, affordability. What does it mean? Okay, we, for one thing, taking into account the income ranges. Um, Camille gave, said, for example, she made a comment that possibly, you know, uh, access to bottled water. We were able to get that for three months, thanks to self-help phone. That was a real good, um, that was something very valuable that they did for our community because uh, people cannot afford it. Uh, we're talking about farm workers who are only working seasonally, uh, playing catch up when work starts because they've been without work for months and um, they just can't afford it. It's a luxury more than anything. And people like, well, I'm on social security. It's very difficult for me to afford it as well because, I, and I do, I do, I, I um, sacrifice more drinking water to be able to have butter to cook with. And um, it shouldn't be that way. I, I know that it shouldn't be that way. We should have access to water. Um, children, you know, are growing up drinking all this water. They can't, of, the parents can't afford it. Um, they can barely afford to put the food on their tables. We, most of the people here are low income, um, below poverty level. Um, and uh, just a moment. And, and yes, when, subject that was brought up that uh, it, the affordability issues also becomes uh, depend, it also depends on the community and how much is the rent, how much is the bills, like in one county, in one city, it could be way different, higher than in the other one. Uh, but uh, when you really think about it, it, it probably winds up pretty level. Um, and um, so housing, you know, we have to consider that if we're paying less for housing here, it's because the housing is uh, not as good as the bigger one, bigger cities. And um, so really it all comes out about the same because uh, the incomes are low. And um, uh, one thing that was mentioned by Michelle was uh, what about uh, taking into account the contents of the letters that have been submitted? Uh, and another thing would be to think of regional differences, the income, and get stats. Um, and then we have topic three water systems financial ability. Do systems have adequate reserves? There was one 
that stood out to me. Um, yes, um, I'm not sure how that works, but um, hoping that they are working towards trying to collect a little bit of reserves. And that's easy to say. I don't know what it, uh, all that entails, but that's something that should definitely be um, taken into account. Um, just in case, you know, uh, a disaster or something, um, it would be good to have the reserves, not just depend on, oh, we'll, we'll get this grant, you know, we'll apply for this grant. Um, just try to be uh, wise in how they, um, how the systems just be trying to be wise in how they um, are trying to collect those reserves, you know, that would be a step in the right direction. I mean, we're not expecting um, them to all get to a certain level because there's a lot of factors that are in, that in details, but, you know, that's, that's very wise to think of. Um, and also, um, I guess that was it. Yeah, that putting money away for, you know, improvements was another. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to uh, be the, the reporter, um, writing very slowly and trying to hear. And thank you. Thank you, Elena. You did a great job. I think I speak for everyone here when I say that. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. I am really impressed with the depth of discussion and with the wealth of information that was shared. And it sounds like you all had really robust discussions in your breakout groups. So thank you all so much for sharing. So every group um, you know, shared something that was different or valuable. I just want to remind you all that if you're interested in points that other groups brought up, please know that there were note takers in each breakout group. And we will collect these notes, state water board staff, and we will include them in our final notes that are sent out to the advisory group. So um, we are gonna move on to public comment at this time. We are just a little bit behind schedule. So if you need to take a break or stretch, feel free to do so, but we're gonna jump right into public comment. And I am going to pass it to Jessica. So Jessica, the mic is yours. It's, thank you, Rizal. Um, You know, uh, before we jump into public comment, we did have a question that came in earlier and I was hoping we could address that. So it was relating to the administrator discussion. So Michelle, if you're still there, um, could you tell us, um, are administrators paid or are they volunteers? I, I am still here. Um, right. So yes, they, they are paid positions that the state would cover the cost of um, their efforts. So they're not volunteers. Um, we would only cover though some portion of, you know, it, they are not designed to cover the entire cost of the water system. Um, and, I, you know, you can ask Joe and DFA folks more about that, but it, you know, they're, we are certainly covering the cost of the administrator themselves and some of their um, workspace and, and think that may be necessary or liability insurance and some of those aspects of it. But, but they aren't designed to, to cover the entire cost of the water system. That should still come from rate base. And Joe, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. It's really a funding discussion. All right, sounds like that's what we have. Thank you, Michelle, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into the comment public comment session. Um, this session is limited to public comments for the SAFER advisory group on the items in today's agenda, which is the um, uh, basically the risk assessment and the affordability discussions that we've been having. So comments on other SAFER topics, such as general, general SAFER program, water issues regarding specific communities, those types of things. We're gonna be hearing those at the SAFER question and answer session today at 1 p.m. So right now we only have two uh, comments to get through. Um, we may have some coming in as we go but uh, each person will have about three minutes to do their comments. Um, and so uh, 
we'll go ahead and jump into that. Our first commenter is, um, let's see, Patty, Patty Avila Garcia from the Community Water Center. Patty, are you there and ready to give us your comment? I see she has called in. Um, so Patty, if you're on the line, you have to press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, sorry about that. I um, There's a lag between the, the webinar and and um, the phone, but um, thank you. This is um, Patty calling from Community Water Center and uh, thank you for the advisory group meeting this morning. Um, first, I just want to say that we appreciate that the State Water Board is setting ambitious goals in the number of projects that are expected to be funded every year to get safe water to as many people as possible. I do want to echo um, what has been brought up in the advisory group um, by the members that the funding um, for these projects, projects needs to get out the door in a timely manner. Um, and that the State Water Board should assess how it can facilitate speeding up project completion so that communities do not have to wait um, seven or eight more years considering that they've already been waiting for drinking water solutions for decades. Um, and then second, as the advisory group highlighted, COVID um, will have a lasting impact on household water bill debt and water systems financial capabilities. So it is important to continue the conversation of what kind of relief can be provided to households who are accumulating debt and to small water systems so that they can continue providing water to communities. Um, and then last, I want to again emphasize the importance of getting a solutions list for the state's small water systems and domestic wells. Um, so we look forward to seeing that work move forward. And um, that's all for this morning. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment. Great, thank you so much, Patty. Um, okay, next we have Stacy Lynn from Mesa Water District. Stacy, are you on the line to um, speak with us or am I going to read that one? Okay, so it looks like Stacy asked for us to read her comment. So I'll go ahead and do that. Stacy said, Mesa Water commends the Safer Advisory Group and the State Water Board on the great progress made to date on SB 200 implementation. We should appreciate participating in the process and look forward to continued engagement, specifically on developing a formula to assess a water system's funding needs, funding gaps, and affordability threshold based on the full true cost of water service that residents pay, including the water meter charge, the water rate charge per unit of water used, and special assessments and taxes. Also, I heard during the presentation that the funds will not total $130 million for this fiscal year. What is the total amount of funding that will be available for implementing SP200 this fiscal year? So um, it, normally we don't respond to questions during the public comment section, but since we don't have any other commenters at this point, um, would uh, someone from DFA, if Jasmine, you're still with us, perhaps you could answer that question. Hi, sure. Uh, this is Jasmine. Um, so we we are going to be receiving, uh, well, all, all signs indicate that we will be receiving the full $130 million. Um, it's just that about $13 million of that is going to be going towards staff costs plus other implementation costs um, that were mandated uh, for, for items that were mandated by SB 200. Um, and so given that there, there will be a total of 117 million for, from the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to go towards projects. Great, thank you for that clarification, Jasmine. And it looks like Stacy is on the call with us. Stacy, did you have anything else you wanted to, um, to state since we do have you on the line? And you should press star six to unmute if you're calling in by phone.
Okay, so well, Stacey, you can always contact us if you have additional questions or um, you can potentially join us for the safer Q&A. Oh, Jessica, this is Joe. I oh, wanted to add one thing to Jasmine's response. Great. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, Jasmine had mentioned we're getting these quarterly um, uh, transfers from the uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund in, <clears throat> into the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. And so if you look at the timing, it's going to be um, like uh, the last transfer will be at, towards the end of the fiscal year. So that doesn't actually give us time to encumber any money into projects with that last installment. So um, it'll be less than that 117 million, uh, you know, probably less than 100 million that we'd be able to encumber this fiscal year. but um certainly we'll be working on developing projects and that money just as a reminder everything that's transferred into the safe and affordable drinking water fund is continuously appropriated so it's available for future years if we don't um, encumber the money in a given fiscal year so uh, it's not like the money goes away it'll be available and we'll be working on getting those funds into projects in the following fiscal year Thanks, Joe. Looks like we have one more comment. And um, Itzel, if you could jump in, I'm having an unstable connection right now. So I may um, end up needing you to jump in. Looks like we have another commenter. So we're just waiting to line that up. Okay, yeah, sure. And just as a reminder to folks, if you are on the webcast, because I know there is a, a delay, you can fill out that online form at the link on the screen, or you can also submit an email to safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, so we might just be seeing a lag. But I do see our next commenter. So I will read it off since it seems like Jessica's having some internet issues. All right. So the comment uh, comes from Mary Ann Warmerdam with the Rural County Representatives of California. And Mary, I don't know if you are on the line. If so, we will try to unmute you. And if not, I will read the comment. Okay, so I'll read it. The comment says, appreciate the level of engagement from the advisory group. The comments reiterate the exact concerns our board of supervisors are receiving from their constituents, both formally and informally. We look forward to the solutions component as anticipated by SB 200. Thank you. All right, so it looks like that's the end of our comments. Is that correct? Itzel, are you seeing anything else? I am not, but we can wait just a second or two. For the lag it, on the webinar, sure. Yeah, but it seems like there are no more comments at this time. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for your help and feedback um, to uh, and your active participation today. I think we had a lot of good conversations. Itzel mentioned that, and, and I also noted that in our group. So that was great. As we approach the close of our meeting, um, we, want to, we want to recap some of our next steps. So if we could, there we go. Um, So as a reminder, uh, the notes from this meeting will be added to the SAFER website for your review. Um, we have some upcoming dates. Again, uh, the advisory group uh, membership application process closes on September 30th. Um, we have the next advisory group meeting, which is gonna be in December, our final one for the year. The date is still be, uh, will be TBD at this point. Um, Itzel, could you remind us of some of those upcoming dates again that we have? Yeah, sure. Thanks. All right. So for those of you, um, September, we have on the 30th, the advisory group member applications are due. And there is also a safer update to the board um, with the date to be determined. In October, on the 2nd, there is a risk assessment webinar. 
On the 6th, there will be a safer update to the board. And on the 30th, the finance dashboard is to be launched. On November 20th, there is a cost estimate webinar. And in December, uh, there is gonna be another safer advisor group meeting, but that date is to be determined. And on the 14th, there is a risk assessment webinar. And that's it on the timeline. Great, thanks so much, Itzel. Um, okay, so for the uh, the next thing is we want to talk about future meeting topics. So we'd ask that you complete the, evalu the evaluation link in your meeting packet. Um, I believe it's also in uh, on our next slide in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, we do want to get your thoughts on other topics you'd like to discuss at future advisory group meetings and at topic specific public workshops because we recognize there's not always a lot of time to get through the many safer related topics and so um, please make sure you let us know if there are areas you'd like to dive a little bit deeper into and maybe that could facilitate, we would need another workshop to facilitate that. Um, we'd also like to know what topics you'd like to prioritize specifically for the December advisory group meeting. So if there are some things that uh, you really wanna make sure we touch on before the end of the year, um, let's do that. The other thing is uh, we have the public Q&A session today from 1 to 3 p.m. So we invite those of you who are available to join us. That would be great. Um, and then finally, uh, we'd like to give you a little bit of time to complete the evaluation um, now, if possible. We have a, a next slide on that. Oh, just the closing. OK, um, you can get started on that or that's something you can also do after the meeting. Um, we're also gonna email it to you. Again, that evaluation form is in your packet. Um, so if you are choosing to fill out your um, evaluation form, I wanna take this opportunity to thank um, you, but I also wanna thank all of the Office of Public Participation staff, the other State Water Board staff, and Board Member Firestone for all of their work on putting this meeting together. Um, it was really a group effort, and I, I think it's showing that we're all trying to come together and um, and make sure that SAFER is a really effective program. And of course, I wanna thank the advisory group members and all of the members of the public for your participation and for guiding us in the right direction. So Itzel? Yes, wanna all right. Wrap things up for us? Sure, thanks, Jessica. All right, so we just went through a lot of information in a pretty short amount of time. And I just wanna invite everyone to look away from their screens for a few seconds. Like just let your eyes rest. Maybe you're looking at something out the window. Maybe you're seeing the smoke from the dozens of fires that are going on um, in our state and in the Northwest right now. Maybe you're looking at a picture somewhere in your home. So try to look um, 20 feet away, try to look at something that's not close to your computer. And as you look away, I'd like for everyone to just reflect on the time that we spent together today. So what was useful about the meeting? What went well? What could be improved? So just sit on that for a few seconds. And I want you all to think about maybe three words as a takeaway or a request that you'd like to make for a future meeting. And if you could have those three words or that request, um, we'd like to take this time for you all to share just in a few seconds um, to share that takeaway or that request when your name is called. So I'm going to start with who I see on my screen first, which is Isabel. So Isabel, if you'd like to share your takeaway, um, please do so. Sí, uh, rápido. Yo digo diálogo en equipo para soluciones para Thank you, short and sweet. So Isabel said um, she was gonna make it quick. The dialogue and the groups, and then she kind of broke off, so I didn't hear that last part. But if anyone else- Okay, did. diálogo. Uh -huh. Okay, diálogo en equipo para soluciones para todos. Okay, dialogue in the teams for solutions for everyone. Thank you, Isabel. Next up, we have Horacio, if you could share your takeaway or your request. Uh, I, I think uh, we have uh, lots of good people in, in the committee and uh, 
they're all sharing uh, a lot of issues that we have with drinking water. And I, and I hope that, uh, that we can find solutions for, for everyone that needs the clean water. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Camille. Um, I'd like to pass, please. Yeah, no worries. Next up, Dawn. Um, yes, I think I would um, say the, the breakout rooms are, are really effective. And I think it's satisfying to be able to talk about some, not just make a statement, but have some discussion back and forth and, and dialogue. I find that really useful. Um, and so I want to say thank you. I appreciate the ability to provide that kind of input. Great, thank you. Elena, you're next. I would have to agree that um, the breakout sessions are really um, helpful and um, you, they help you um, kind of get to know each other better and, and, and learn from each other. And I'm thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's see who is on my list. Um, Katie, if you'd like to share. Yeah, so the words that came to my mind were also dialogue, because I thought it was interesting when we could have a, more of an exchange of, of information and feed off of each other's ideas and thoughts and build on each other. Uh, specificity was another one, because when we really got into uh, what does it mean to be defined as at risk? I think that's where we really saw how many different ways you could look at the same uh, topic. And then uh, preparation, I, I think, um, I, I appreciate getting the packet in advance, that's helpful, but, uh, but even, even having more time to really understand and digest everything that's in it, and I appreciate the summary at the beginning, but it it's sometimes still feels like there, there isn't uh, still yet enough time, especially when uh, for those of us who are representing larger groups and, and trying to make sure that, that we really distilled what we want to represent as a viewpoint. Thank you for that, Katie. Um, it has been noted. Next, Lucy, if you'd like to share. Uh, yes, um, yeah, I think that group uh, session, it was really good. Um, I really enjoy uh, having to say what I need to say and be able to uh, have a feedback or everybody is in the same um, topic that we are in the same issue. And I, th I think that really worked out for having this 30 minutes and, and groups. So I'm very grateful for that. And I think uh, that is important for us uh, to, to continue working together, like I always mentioned, and no matter what situation we're, uh, we're on, uh, that we're on this together and we are looking to a better solutions for our communities. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Next, uh, Michael Claiborne, if you'd like to share, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sure, I uh, agree with uh, everyone that said, appreciate the dialogue today. I look forward to talking more about both affordability and at risk, defining at risk over the next few months. I think in terms of our request, just echoing the comments that Patty with, uh, community water center had just said I'd love to at a future meeting explore whether there are ways to speed up the process for um, getting funding and solutions implemented whether that's in the application process or environmental review or um, the board's internal review process um, I'd love to explore that more as this group all right thank you for that uh, Nicholas you're next if you'd like to share your three word takeaway or a request for a future meeting. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Uh, I, I would just say, I really appreciated the breakout sessions today. I felt like um, those are a great way to uh, work together, get information out to the different groups, makes it a much uh, more intimate setting to discuss things that you know you feel are important. So I, I, would, I would definitely say to continue to uh, to work on those and, and making sure that we can have those opportunities to discuss with each other. 
Great, thank you for your feedback. And I believe last on my list, Sergio, if you'd like to share. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, first off, I would like to to, to say uh, to thank you, everyone. Uh, this is a great opportunity to work together and to have a real interaction about different perspectives, especially from the community. Um, we bring that that area that is critical, but it's also go the other way around. So to better understand the processes of, of, of the state water boards. I would like also to second Michael uh, recommendation for the next topic. We need to have a permanent agenda item that uh, provide a more deep analysis and assessment about the existing uh, you know, grant uh, processes, which include all the, the, the packages. Uh, uh, the reason I'm, I'm bringing this is because the pandemic has made things extremely worse than ever before. So we have projects that we have been working from the last uh, six years already. And I believe there is an incredible opportunity to improve and, and streamline that process from grant application all the way to deployment so that we can implement those process. So I will definitely second his uh, uh, opinion and thought on that so that we can uh, further analyze what else can we do to improve this process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sergio. All right, I believe that was all of our advisory group members on the line today. So I just wanna thank you all for sharing. Um, we really do take your feedback into account for our future meetings. And so we will continue to do so. We're taking note of this and uh, we're looking to improve, continually improve these meetings as we go forward. So thank you all so much for sharing. And I'm now gonna pass the mic back to Jessica to do our final closeout. All right, thanks again, everyone for participating today. If all of our, uh, if everyone on the line could please unmute yourself now. Um, at the same time, please repeat after me. Water should be safe. Water should, water should be safe. Water will be safe. Water, water will be safe. One more time in Spanish. Una vez más en español. Everybody, repeat after me. Agua debería ser sana. Agua debería ser sana. Ser sana. Agua será sana. Agua será sana. Thanks, everyone. We will see you very soon. Thank oh. you, everybody. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. 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 Adios.